The Sixth Grade Nickname Game by Gordon Corman, read with permission from Scholastic by Mrs. Leader. Chapter 6. Know any good bird doctors? Wiley and Jeff always met at one of their houses for breakfast before school each morning. Today the Adamson home was a spot with bagels and orange juice on the menu, but the topic of conversation was the same one that had dominated breakfast for the last two weeks, a nickname for Cassandra. I still say we should concentrate on the way she can tune out the whole world, was Jeff's opinion. Maybe dizzy? Wiley shook his head. Too negative. He took a bite of his bagel and talked, about, talked around it. She's got those combat boots. Why don't we call her G.I. Jane? Yeah, but she's more than a pair of boots, Jeff reasoned. She creamed everybody at arm wrestling at Valley Forge. How about Miss Schwarzenegger? Not bad, Wiley approved, but it leaves out all the other stuff about her. He slammed down his juice glass. Man, we've never had this kind of a problem with a nickname before. Why do you have to call her anything? Came the bored voice of Lisa Adamson, Wiley's 16-year-old sister. Butt out, groaned her brother. It's a legitimate question, she persisted. Why does the whole world have to have a nickname? It just does, groaned Wiley. All right, she challenged. What's my nickname? It's only for our school, Jeff said nervously. Actually, Wiley and Jeff did have a s secret ti title for Lisa. Soap Opera Adamson, or Soap for short. It referred to her love life, which Wiley and Jeff knew well. They had been there for most of it. Spine from the bushes or hiding in the base hidden in the basement, usually doubled over with laughter. Lisa smirked at her brother. I think you have a crush on Cassandra. No way, scoffed Wiley. Then why are you blushing? Wiley glared at her. Shut up. Shut upper than you've ever shut up before. Leave the poor kid alone, mumbled Donald Briscoe, Lisa's boyfriend, and lift to school. Come on, eat up. I've got an early football practice. Hey, said Wiley. If you play football, you must know Mr. Huge. Donald frowned. Huge? Oh, mean, you mean Coach Hughes? Sure, I know him. He's our new teacher, Jeff told him. Donald looked horrified. They took a football coach and turned him into a teacher? He snapped his fingers. That explains why he's been acting so strange lately. He's been wa acting pretty strange in our class, too, Wiley grinned. Tell me about it, sighed Donald. He's too strict, too quiet, never gets excited, never breaks a sweat of practice. He's almost a zombie. Mr. Huge? Chorus Wiley and Jeff. In disbelief, of all the words to describe the new teacher, zombie was last on the list. Are Mr. Huge? Lisa downed her orange juice and stood up. Ready. As the couple left the house, Wiley and Jeff took their usual positions at the living room window. It was always a spectacle to watch Donald Briscoe operate a motor vehicle. He could back out of a driveway like he was racing in the Indianapolis 500. This had earned him the nickname Indy. His car was an ancient Chevy Blazer with a raised chassis and monster truck tires. He reversed out on into the road at breakneck speed, shifting gears with a gut-wrenching screech. Lump! A dark blue flew into the cloud of burned oil and bounced off the blazer. Oblivious to the collision, collision, Donald and Lisa disappeared down the street at 60 miles an hour. Wiley and Jeff ran into the scene, waving their arms to clear the smoke. What was that? asked Jeff. Wiley was the first to see it. A small brownish bird lay at the base of the curbstone. Cautiously, he turned the victim over with the toe of his sneaker. I think it's dead. And then the feathers moved. It's alive, shouted Je cheered Jeff. Stunned, the mysterious bird struggled to right itself. It certainly was a strange looking creature. It was a dark mustard color except for the top of its head. There the feathers were the brilliant blue. Wiley frowned. I know this is crazy, but it looks kind of familiar. Just then, the tiny beak opened and a faint, sickly sound was heard. A sort of weak warbling. It hit both boys at the same time. The blue-crested warbler sparrow, they chorused. That's where we saw it, Wiley added, breathlessly. Cassandra's project. 
She loves the blue crested warbler sparrow, explained Jeff. Let's go call her. Not so fast, Wiley grabbed him by the belt. This bird just took a direct hit from the lady, the Indy mobile. All the more reason why we should call her right away, Jeff argued, so she gets a chance to see it before it dies. Think, ordered Wiley, tapping his temple. If we show her a blue crested warbler sparrow and it croaks on her, she'll be crushed. We've got to nurse this bird back to health. Then we can take it to Cassandra. You're right, Jeff agreed. Both boys spent a long moment examining the tiny patient. Uh, know any good bird doctors? Jeff asked finally. How about your mom, Wiley suggested. She's a nurse. Yeah, but for people. And besides, she's already at work. Well, said Wiley decisively, we had a gerbil once, and Indy sideswiped it. My mom pulled it through. Mrs. Adamson finished wrapping the gauze around the popsicle stick splint that supported the sparrow's broken wing. There, that should do it. Wiley scratched his head. I don't know, Mom. I don't think he's going to make it. He can barely warble. He's more dead duck than warbler sparrow, Jeff confirmed mournfully. That should be his name, Wiley agreed. D.D. for short. He might be a girl. He might be a girl, Mrs. Adamson pointed out. Jeff shook his head. The ones with the blue crest are the males. He's a he, all right. Mrs. Adamson looked surprised. I didn't know you boys were bird experts. Oh, it's not us, Wiley explained. We sit next to the world's greatest authority on the blue crested warbler sparrow. It won't help, Jeff put in. I don't think D.D. is going to be around for long. His happy, his happy mental image of presenting Cassandra with her favorite, very favorite endangered bird was replaced by a new, grimmer picture. It was he and Wiley burying D.D. In, in the grocery bag in the backyard. Don't be such a couple of pessimists, Wiley's mother laughed. The poor little creature is just dazed and scared. When his wing heals, he should be just fine. The boys lined a plastic laundry basket with a soft blanket and placed the injured bird tenderly inside. They carried D.D. to the big tool shed that stood on the property line between the Adamson house and the Green Mom's next door. Both families shared the shed, so the bird was being held in joint custody. Carefully, Wiley set an old window screen across the top of the basket so he won't fly away, he exclaimed, explained. Jeff laughed mirthlessly. Dee Dee couldn't fly if he strapped a jet engine to his tail feathers. As if on cue, the bird lifted to his little blue head and managed a fairly respectable warble. Wiley raised an eyebrow. Maybe he's not going to die, he said hopefully. Maybe he's going to live. And get really strong, added Jeff. He'll be a professional wrestler, Wiley agreed, with big muscular feathers. He'll use his super strength to fight crime. He'll be elected president of the United States. Wiley cackled in triumph. And then we'll take him over to the old gunhold place and show him to Cassandra. Laughing, they traded high fives over the basket. Jeff grabbed his arm. Come on, we'll be late for school. They arrived just as the bell rang. There was a commotion in the halls. The schoolyard softball players were cheering and babbling. Ecstatic high-fives flew in all directions. A waving V for victory sign practically poked Jeff's eye out. He escaped into room 6B, running for his life. Hey, cut it out! What's going on? Wiley added, mystified. Peter burst in after them. Where were you guys? You just missed the greatest moment in softball history. Raymond belched the word, awesome. If I didn't see it with my own eyes, added Christy, I wouldn't believe it. Wiley stared at them. A game we have twice a day, every day? What could happen? Kelly gave the play-by-play. -play. We were down by three, two outs, bases loaded, when the, with the bell about to ring. And who comes up to bat? The Iceman. What Iceman? asked Jeff. His jaw dropped. Our Iceman? Mike Smith? He caught a wink and a leer from Charles. Now I know why they call him the Iceman. Peter went on. He's got water in his veins. 
He hit the ball so hard it's in China. The longest Grand Slam home run in the history of oops. The bright lights carried him into 6A. You see, whispered Charles, Iceman, it's uh, sticking like crazy glue. One lucky swing, Wiles, Wiley shrugged. Are you trying to welch, Charles demanded. That means he's trying to get out of the bet. Jeff sighed. Look, we admit that something weird is going on with Mike Smith, but that, not, but that's not the same as the true nickname. Are you listening to me? Charles was leaning like the famous Tower of Pisa over the classroom door. Shh, he cautioned. Do you hear that? Jeff frowned. Hear what? Stealthy as a cat, Charles glided across the room and flattened himself against the wall beside the door frame. Wiley rolled his eyes. He can't even stop snooping long enough to argue about being Snoopy. Charles beckoned madly. Get over here, he hissed. They're talking about us in the hall. Wiley and Jeff joined him in, at his listening post. Cassandra wandered over. What's up? Our very first snoop, Wiley wisecracked. Now I know what it's like to be Charles Rossi. She laughed, but suddenly fell suddenly silent when she heard a phrase that would, could only have come from one person. 110%. It's Mr. Huge, she whispered. Mr. Doncaster was the other speaker, and the principal did not sound friendly. Mr. Hughes, this is very serious. The state reading assessment is how we decide whether or not a sixth grade grader is ready for junior high, and your class did horribly on the practice exam. They were all stars, they heard their teacher exclaim. The league leading MVP, electrifying Bo Pro Bowl Hall of Fame. Not now, Mr. Doncaster interrupted impatiently. I've never seen number two pencils fill in ovals like that, Mr. Hughes insisted. You could feel the effort in the room. Effort, maybe, but no results, Mr. Doncaster complained. Your scores were nowhere near six A's. Many were below grade level. All were unacceptable. I accept them, came the firm voice of Mr. Hughes. Well, you're the only one who does snapped the principal. If I thought that they weren't trying, the teacher said tersely, I'd be the first one in there whipping butts into shape. But I'm not going to allow anybody to say any let my class isn't first sitting string. I'm so let me start over. Sorry about that. But I'm not going to allow anyone to say my class isn't first string when I know they're giving 110%. Who cares about test scores? Oh, nobody, the principal was voice dripped with sarcasm except maybe the Department of Education, the school board, the parents, and me. The real test is less than a month away. Get your class prepared. Good old Mr. Hughes, whispered Cassandra. He's a total sweetheart. Sweetheart, repeated Charles. He's the craziest teacher in school. He's sure sticking up for us to deer in, to deer in headlights, commented Jeff. Why doesn't he just blame Mrs. Reagan? She was our teacher until two weeks ago. Maybe he thinks he can light up the dim bulbs, snickered Peter. I hate that name, Cassandra said sharply. Mr. Hughes is right. We should stop using it. Mr. Hughes is the whole problem, Charles accused. Who can read and answer questions with a six-foot-five maniac bouncing himself off the walls? That wasn't a test. It was like, like feeding time at the zoo. I think it's cool, kind of cool when Mr. Hughes goes ballistic put in Wiley. I've never had a teacher who cares so much about trying hard. You look at him sweating and you can't help doing your super best. He's like our own personal cheerleader, added Jeff. Not even the bright lights have that. They heard the principal's angry footsteps tapping down the hall and scrambled to get back in their seats. That will be the end of chapter six. We'll move on to chapter seven. It's called Stop Cops. Thank you for listening to the sixth grade nickname game.